Good morning. It's Tuesday, the 19th of March, and this is Govind Rajethri Raj broadcasting from Mumbai, India's financial capital. Our top stories and themes for the day. The signs of exhaustion in Indian markets are setting in as the slog overs begin. Oil hits a four month high at $86 a barrel. What could that mean? A payments bank is a flawed business model, says the former State Bank of India chairman. Tesla gets a red carpet, but a Vietnamese electric vehicle company could walk on it first. And exports spiked in the month of February. The question, will it sustain? This is a core report with Govind Raj Athiraj. Markets swing between uncertainty and exhaustion. The markets are suffering from a problem of too much knowledge in some ways. While corporate performance could surprise in specific cases or there could be industry shifts like prices for raw material going up or down or some policy-induced action like an increase in prices of petrol and diesel which could affect oil marketing companies, the larger market direction, particularly for a consistent move, is dependent on big signals. The big signal at this point is clearly political. The problem is that the market already believes and is convinced that the ruling party will return and therefore has priced in a victory, though there is some speculation on how many seats the party will win and so on. Be that as it may, it would take a real surprise on the downside to shake the market. So that is a problem in some ways because there is no new direction. But results are for June 4th for elections that will start on April 19th. And with the model code of conduct, no major announcements can be made till elections are over. So till then, the markets are likely to respond to a combination of factors, including, of course, the stress in the middle segment comprising small caps and mid caps, which is, of course, negative. On the positive side, there could be external factors like fund flows from overseas, which is an important factor, no doubt. And as we pointed out yesterday as well, foreign institutional investors have returned to India after many months and gone shopping, particularly in equities. While that is an important trigger, times are different now with domestic flows also being strong, so much so that they easily absorbed the bulk of FII selling in January. We are talking of, once again, equity here because in the case of debt, as we've been saying, there has been steady buying in recent months. And to return to the present, the benchmark BSE Sensex was up 105 points to 72,748 after moving up and down during the day, while the Nifty 50, on the other hand, ended at 22,056 up about 32 points. The mid-cap and small-cap indices were somewhat flat, but as you know, have lost a fair bit since late February when the fall began. The Nifty had hit an all-time high on March 11th, just so that you know where we stand today on the 19th of March before trade begins. Analysts at stock brokerage Philip Capital summed it up best to Reuters when they said, we are seeing signs of exhaustion in the Indian markets, and they added that there could be corrections because of stretched valuations. Elsewhere, there's considerable action in the steel and iron ore space, all driven by China. Metal stocks rose thanks to a stronger-than-expected factory output and retail sales data from China, the world's top metal producer and consumer of metals, Reuters said. Yesterday, we spoke of how iron ore prices are weak, but copper prices are strong. And of course, steel prices are high now, and iron ore is a key input into steel production. China's industrial output increased 7% in January and February compared to the same period last year, according to the National Bureau of Statistics announcements in China on Monday, which was significantly faster than what economists had predicted, according to Bloomberg. On Wall Street, S&P 500 futures climbed on Monday as Wall Street awaited a key artificial intelligence conference and looked ahead to monetary policy guidance from the Federal Reserve later this week, according to CNBC. Futures linked to S&P 500, Nasdaq 100 and the Dow Jones Industrial Average were all up overnight. The mutual fund stress tests are on. Market Regulator Securities and Exchange Report of India had directed, as we know now, all mutual funds to assess their liquidity and how liquid their underlying portfolios really were. The first round of results, according to Money Control, showed that it would take an average of about six days for mid-cap funds to liquidate 50% of their portfolios and about 14 days on average for small-cap funds to liquidate 50% of their portfolios if equity markets were to collapse badly and investors rush to the door for redemptions. Now, this is great news to know. 
And possibly SEBI is doing all it can to fight the froth and alert investors, but I increasingly feel this exercise will not really work, except to scare off one set of investors who perhaps deserve to be scared off anyway. Otherwise, it's near impossible for anyone to act on this knowledge in any meaningful way. But of course, SEBI can always say, we told you so. Though I feel another way is to force companies themselves in these mid-cap or small-cap segments to disclose much more on their financials with some additional ratios perhaps, including on cash flows, which are evidently suspect in some cases. What these additional disclosure elements could be, I'm not fully sure, but I'm confident that they could surely be, and I will come back on this. Now, all of this will not prevent the froth or a bloodbath if one is ordained, but could make it a little more easy and specific for investors to focus on, at least at this point of time. I must add that brokerages too are sending out signals which are, well, quite confusing, though logical from their perspective. And when I say confusing, because these are specific stock alerts on small cap and mid cap stocks. Now, the buy signals are fine, but investors must be careful since there is a overhang on the entire market. Meanwhile, Tata Sons, the investment arm of Indian conglomerate Tata Group, is offering to sell about 23 million shares in Tata Consultancy Services in a deal worth about $1.1 billion, according to IFR, a fixed income news service. The TCS price closed at about 4,152 today. Tata Sons holds a 72% stake in TCS as of December 31st. The shares will be sold at a floor price of 4,000 and a 3.7% discount to last close. The share sale is believed to be linked to some regulatory requirements on non-bank finance company structures for Tata Sons. Oil hits a four-month high. Oil hit a fresh four-month high as Chinese economic data beat expectations and Ukrainian drone attacks on Russian refineries heightened geopolitical risks, according to Bloomberg. Global benchmark Brent crude rose to about $86 a barrel after gaining 4% last week. As we've been mentioning earlier, in the context of steel, China's factory output and investment grew more strongly than expected at the start of year and oil refining in China hit a record. So we've been tracking crude in its tight trading range that dominated the opening months of the year with prices recently hitting the highest level since November. The Organization of Petroleum Exporting Countries, or OPEC+, Plus, as we know, has cut back production even as the International Energy Agency has warned of a supply deficit throughout the year. Crude inventories in the United States are also falling. Payments bank model is flawed, says former state bank chairman. The payment bank is a flawed business model and it needs a relook, former State Bank of India Chairman Rajneesh Kumar told the Economic Times. He pointed out that mostly banks make money through intermediation. You take deposits and you lend them. But merely mobilizing deposits and putting them in government securities doesn't work. You may say it's a low-cost deposit, but it is actually not low-cost because operational costs are very high for mobilizing current and savings deposits. Sometimes the fixed deposit product may be cheaper than the former because you need the entire network of payment banks. I of course wonder why it would take someone so long to acknowledge something that was pretty clear, at least to me, several years ago. Maybe a year after payments banks were launched as a fairly pointless and unnecessary workaround, which in turn created half, if not most of the froth in the fintech ecosystem. Mr. Kumar also said he was apprehensive as a banker when the payments bank model came. Narrow banking does not work, he said. There are proposals to allow payment banks to offer micro loans. Then he said, or rather asked, what could be the difference between a small finance bank and a payments bank? He also said that he didn't see a future for payments bank because there is no money in payments after the UPI. There is a huge customer acquisition cost and he asked, how would you cover that? Whatever has happened will be learning for everyone on how to build a sustainable business. We've just touched the tip of the iceberg, he told the Economic Times. Tesla gets a red carpet, Vietnam's Winfast might walk on it. Vietnam's electric car maker Winfast Auto on Monday said India's new electric vehicle policy that provides import duty concessions for companies setting up manufacturing units in the country will allow it to introduce a wide variety of eco-friendly, premium quality SUVs at inclusive prices, according to the Economic Times. This forward-looking policy helps us introduce a wide variety of smart, green, premium quality SUVs at inclusive prices along with outstanding after-sales policies, Winfast India CEO Pham San Chao said in a statement. In February, Winfast 
had said that it would invest about 4000 crore rupees over the next 5 years in the initial phase and would generate 3500 jobs in the Tuti Koran region in Tamil Nadu. The plant will have a capacity to produce about 150000 vehicles once it became operational. As we reported yesterday, companies setting up manufacturing facilities for EV cars will be allowed to import a limited number of cars at lower duties of 15% on vehicles costing $35,000 or more for 5 years from the date of approval. Current customs duties on imported cars range between 70 to 100% depending on the engine size and cost insurance and freight value. Meanwhile, and not surprisingly at all, German and some other multinational car companies have expressed concerns that they may not get a level playing field as special import duty rates could be given only to new entrants but may not be extended to existing players according to the Times of India. Auto giants like BMW, Volkswagen and Mercedes-Benz are already considering their official position on the matter with their Indian subsidiaries briefing global headquarters about the new tax regime that's been announced by the Indian government last week, sources told the Times of India. Other companies like Korean, Hyundai and Kia, apart from some of the Indian companies, feel their early investments in the electric space should be counted retrospectively. Sources told TOI that the companies feel they should not be penalized just because they were the first ones or early ones to invest in electric vehicle production and localization in line with the government's thinking. So maybe they are included or maybe they are not, but the policy announced over the weekend seemed silent on it or at least was by inference as the car makers would have known. Now, this was clearly avoidable. The policy has clearly been tweaked and garnished for Tesla, and that's fine because Tesla does bring badge value and appeal. But the policy could have surely contained clear references to existing investments, including of overseas car makers who've been in India for almost three decades now. Exports are up. Will it sustain? India reported a roughly 12% annualized increase in merchandise exports at about $41 billion for the month of February. The main drivers for this were engineering goods, electronics, chemicals, petroleum products, drugs and pharmaceuticals. Imports also rose by about 12% to $60 billion, showing a four-month high growth. Engineering goods, for example, rose 16%, while electronics rose about 55%. This is all exports. The last time figures showed such a high growth was in March 2023 when it was about $42 billion. I reached out to Dr. Ajay Sai, Director General and CEO of the Federation of Indian Export Organizations, and I began by asking him what stood out for the month of February and, more importantly, what was the consistent outlook ahead? I think there are a couple of sectors which have done exceptionally well, which overall pushed the exports of the month of February. Uh, in fact, we were quite sure of that because when we looked at the port-wise data of exports, the port-wise data, which basically denotes the volume-wise exports, pointed towards a good growth in India's exports. And if you look into the data for the month of February, certain sectors like electronic, they grew by around 55%, organic and organic chemical by 33%, drugs and pharma by around 22%, engineering by around 16%. Many sectors in the agro and processed food, for example, meat, tobacco, oil seeds, they've also performed exceedingly well. So probably because of these factors, we have seen a good growth in exports and these numbers are quite impressive looking into the global bid and the current geopolitical situation. If I can ask you about outlook now, do you feel that this trend could continue? And you said you were looking at port traffic as well. So what is that telling you for March and onwards? March on March will be definitely positive and that's why we feel that probably to a large extent we will be crossing whatever goods and services exports together we achieved in last fiscal year and uh, in this year maybe on the good side either we will be touching the numbers or we may be faltering by a billion or so but on the services front I'm expecting the overall numbers to grow by around 10 billion or more. I'm not sure of the the export from the third quarter of 2024 because global situation is still very challenging. Countries are struggling to bring the inflation down, though of course inflation has come down as compared to quite a high elevated level, but it still is a cause of concern. Interest rates are still quite elevated and though everyone was expecting the Fed to bring down the key rates, which has not been done, we are expecting that probably in the next review, it may or may not come down. 
So overall, it will be a challenging time for the global trade. All countries will be impacted. India will not be an exception, but since India is showing very good growth despite the challenges, we expect that to some extent we will be performing much better than most of the economies. Right. To come back to the sort of first question I asked you as well, and to round it off, what are the sectors that you're seeing consistent growth? So, for example, let's say smartphone exports is also because we've raised you know, manufacturing capacity or increased manufacturing capacity in India. So that's a secular change which could continue. Is there anything else that you're seeing like that? In fact, my understanding of the situation is that Indian exports are moving towards a technology-driven sectors of exports. So it's not the smartphone alone. Electronics, machinery, automobile, electricals, these will be the products and maybe tomorrow's civil aviation, defense product, is combat item. These will be driving India's export in medium to long-term basis. And that's why the profile of India's exports will undergo a sea change. And I think we are now aligning ourselves with the rising global imports. Today, if you look into global imports, it's totally technology-driven. Electrical, electronics, machinery, automobile, they put together have roughly 35% of the global import share to a whopping figure of around $7 trillion or more. And fortunately for us, these are the sectors which are covered by the PLI scheme. So we hope that over a period of three to five years, we will have much more capability bringing many new units into these segments, which will not only cater to the domestic market, bringing down the imports, but of course they will be generating a huge production, helping us to increase our exports also. Uh, that's why we feel that now our export strategy has to factor both the sunrise sectors of exports and of course the employment intensive sectors of export. They may not be contributing a lot in terms of the value, but they are extremely important for creating jobs into the country, which is our other priority. Right. And last question. So, obviously, we've had uh, problems with transporting goods, including around the Red Sea and therefore the increased costs. Is that showing up anywhere, the increased logistics costs, time taken and so on? Freight has impacted all the exporting companies, particularly where the contract is CINF or CNDF. It has impacted the bottom line of the companies also. One of the reasons why Indian exports are still showing good growth is the fact that the companies are under the contract to execute even if they are incurring a loss. Tomorrow when they are going for the renewal of contract, the basic issue is whether the buyer is willing to provide the increase in the freight or not. In 50% of the cases where these contracts have been renewed, buyer has allowed the factoring of the freight rate into the prices. In 25% of the cases, it has not happened. 25% are still being negotiated. Uh, so my view is that the real challenge to exports will be seen when new contracts are signed. One of the reasons it is one of the segments where we will be feeling the hit is probably the commodities because in the commodities, there is not enough cushion to factor the increase in the freight rate. The good news is that even when we are talking about the freight, the freight rate to certain destinations, certain regions have come down. For example, India is uh, freight to North Europe or to some extent to Africa and even to East Coast of the US has come down. But freight to the West Coast, freight to the Latin American countries have gone drastically up. So it's still their picture is not very clear. We are hoping that probably over a period of time, they the trade will start absorbing the freight partly by the bar, partly by the sellers. Dr. Sai, thank you so much for joining me. Thank you. Thank you. That was The Core Report with me, Govindraj Ethiraj. Do stay connected with more of our coverage at The Core. You can check out our website or sign up to our newsletter for our exclusive stories, one in-depth feature a day on www.thecore.in. Do also track us on LinkedIn, where we usually post synopsis or extracts of our top stories and interviews. We would love your feedback on how we can make business more interesting and relevant, including, of course, India's vibrant manufacturing sector. So write to us at feedback at the core.in. And thank you once again for listening.